the apocalyptic character of Israel's hopes fades as the church becomes more and more Gentile, as a kind of Neoplatonic, big picture story reasserts itself in a Christian form. We lose the sense of expectation of God's deliverance in an evil world. And salvation becomes more of a, uh, an escape from the world than a judgment of the world. The stuff about salvation moves farther and farther away from the stuff on judgment. You can see this in theology courses, actually, where uh, salvation is treated in the middle of the course under the banner of Jesus Christ, and then judgment day is treated at the very end of the course as the last thing of all. Whereas actually in the Apostles' Creed, it's not that way, is it? He will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. Judgment, hap judgment is treated under the heading of the second article of the Creed, under Jesus Christ. Because judgment isn't the opposite of salvation, judgment is an aspect of salvation. Now see, this is what Israel got in the first century that for things to be made right in a world gone wrong, God has to judge. God has to put a stop to what's wrong. Our salvation depends on God's judgment. Don't think of judgment and salvation as two incompatible things where you're either subject to one or the other. Salvation and judgment are two sides of the same coin. There are two aspects of God's one action to put away evil and restore goodness. Let me give you an illustration of this from 1 Peter chapter 3, down in 13. Who's to harm you if you're zealous for what is right? But even if you do suffer for the sake of righteousness, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, your persecutors. Don't be troubled. But in your hearts, reverence Christ as Lord. There's a reason that that connection is there. Jesus is the Messiah, right? Jesus is God's answer to Israel's suffering in an evil world. Keep your conscience clear. 17, for it's better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. That sounds a little like the problem of evil. How can people suffer for doing right if the world is a good world from a good God? Well, let's hear, out, let's hear out the passage. For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Suffering for the sake of righteousness begins and ends with Jesus the Messiah. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Um, we'll push pause. What? Uh, what do you think that passage is referring to? This is the descent into hell. That is how you'll almost always hear this passage interpreted. This is when Jesus goes down to the dead between Friday and Sunday. But look again at the passage. Look at verse 18. He was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. It is in the spirit that he goes. It is at his resurrection that he goes and preaches to the spirits in prison. This isn't a descent before his resurrection. Huh? Uh, who are these spirits in prison? Well, let's go on. It gets weirder. The spirits in prison who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Okay. Who are these spirits in prison who had disobeyed during the days of Noah? Genesis 6. They probably didn't show you this passage in youth group. <laughs> when men began to multiply, people began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, angelic beings maybe, saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took to wife such of them as they chose. I don't really know what to do with this verse historically or scientifically, but this is as things are unraveling and it soon says, 
the thoughts of human beings on the earth were only evil all the time, and God repented that he, made, that he had made humanity and said, I'm going to wipe them all out. But Noah found favor with God. And so Noah and his family are delivered from this world of violence and this world of perversion, where everything is wrong. Okay? Those spirits, those rebellious beings, according to popular folklore of the day, uh, in a book called First Enoch, describes this. Um, they're kept in prison for Judgment Day. They are called the Watchers. Um, if you're a first century Jew, that's part of your folklore. That there are heavenly you know, beings, rebellious beings that are in prison and waiting for final judgment. And they represent, they represent a great rebellion against the order of things. This is taking on the tropes of, of the thinking of the day and using it to tell the good news. So these, these beings, these powerful, rebellious, imprisoned beings, what happens to them? Jesus, at his resurrection, which is his victory, goes and, and dances an end zone dance in front of them. He runs a victory lap. He was made alive in the spirit in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison who hadn't obeyed when God's patience waited during the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. Now hear that phrase. This was a bad day if you were a rebellious angel, but this was a good day if you were in Noah's family. If you were on that ark, you were finally released. Eight persons were saved through water. Okay, hold on to that image. The water of judgment in Genesis is the water of salvation if you're on the boat. The one act has both effects. This runs all through the scriptures. And we think of this one act as a bad thing because it'll overturn the life that we've become accustomed to. But if you're suffering, if you're a victim, if you're just holding on trying to endure in an intolerable world, in an intolerable situation, your, your hope is for that situation to come to an end. Your hope is for judgment. Okay? 1 Peter 3 is going to bring this right into its own day. Baptism, which is a type of this, now saves you. God's water of judgment on your life is God's water of salvation for your life. I need deliverance from me. I need deliverance from my old self. God's patience waited and waited in Noah's day for people to come around, and it didn't happen. Okay, what's baptism here in the passage? It's not a removal of dirt from the body, but it's an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Christ. All right? Baptism is an appeal to God through the resurrection of Jesus for a clear conscience. This is a resurrection passage, not a descent into hell passage. Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Okay? All authorities. Everything that can harass you is below Jesus, who's at the right hand of God. Critical stuff. Judgment is part of salvation. There are times in your life when you can't see this. There's times in your life when you can't help but see it. So let me give you a couple of images. Here's an image from the west front of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. This is above a doorway, right? You have the angels all above, and, and you have the saints in heaven watching this scene. It's judgment Day. The dead are rising. It's the day of resurrection. And you have one group at Jesus' right hand looking up. It's the day of their vindication and their promotion. Come enter into the joy of your master. It's a good day. And you have another one being led away in chains with a devil. 
you didn't help your brothers and sisters, you didn't serve me, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to let you go. I don't have a place for you in my reign. That's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And here's the judge himself, Jesus on the throne. It's a bad day and it's also a good day. Or here's another image, a Celtic high cross from Ireland. These are all over Ireland. Here's a figure in the middle with a scepter and surrounded by many. That's the judge, yep. I want to draw your attention down here. There are these two big beings holding what look like swords and three tiny little figures being sheltered by this being's wings. That's a Bible story. Can anybody guess what Bible passage that is? Yep, that's Rakshak and Benny, <laughs> who are sent to the fiery furnace, and when the guard looks in, I see four. I see them, and then I see one like a son of God, which tradition took to be a kind of appearance of Jesus the Savior. They are being protected, judged, you might say, vindicated in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution. At the top, Jesus the judge, Jesus reigning with a scepter, or maybe it's a rod of iron, he is the one protecting the innocent, judging them innocent, so they escape the furnace. That's the logic of a Christian doctrine of judgment. Probably the biggest task with this lecture is is, uh, or really this topic, is retraining our imagination to think of judgment the way that Israel, Jesus, and the church thought of judgment. Because we really don't. We, don't. we don't put the topic of judgment or the topic of evil through Atlanta, through the refining focus on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so we don't see them in truly Christian perspective. And the task is to learn how to see them that way. You'll find the, the New Testament makes a lot more sense when you do. The Old Testament makes a lot more sense when you do.